Uh, today we have a first lecture on uh, uh, fluid mechanics two course. Uh, uh, today we are going to uh, study the subject of fluid mechanics, what the subject is all about uh, and some motivation behind fluid mechanics uh, and then we will talk about uh, the laws which are actually required in solving uh, scientific problems. Uh, and uh, we will look briefly on the engineering approach of solving the problem uh, and then we will talk about uh, fluid definition um, and uh, we'll talk about viscosity and Newton's law of viscosity and uh, uh, the types of fluids, uh, uh, the broad classification that is Newtonian and non-Newtonian fluids. Uh, and in the end, uh, uh, we will solve some problems uh, which are based on Newton's law of viscosity. Uh, the subject of uh, fluid mechanics is actually, think of a branch of mechanics actually. And uh, as you know, in mechanics, we are dealing with uh, uh, objects that are in motion and uh, uh, not just uh, the objects in motion, but uh, the forces which actually has caused uh, motion. So if the substance is a uh, solid, then we call it, uh, the whole study is called solid mechanics and if the uh, substance is not solid, is fluid, uh, then the study is called fluid mechanics and uh, there are further branches uh, uh, of fluid mechanics, uh, uh, what you call it fluid statics when the uh, fluid is at rest position and uh, when fluid is in motion we call it fluid kinematics and fluid dynamics. So, uh, in fluid kinematics we study the motion of the fluid, uh, its displacement, its velocity, its acceleration uh, and uh, other things uh, uh, without uh, focusing on the forces which actually has caused the motion. In fluid dynamics, uh, we are not just interested in kinematics, so we are interested in kinematics uh, as well as uh, the forces that actually has caused uh, uh, motion. So uh, fluid mechanics is a big subject and uh, it has uh, huge applications from uh, our body to everyday life and to engineering problems. Uh, okay, we have... Uh, 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 an example in which uh, uh, for watering plants, uh, if we just reduce the uh, area of the nozzle, what happens is the fluid velocity increases as uh, the water is able to travel more distance uh, and uh, the whole fluid uh, mechanics expressions are involved in uh, uh, such cases. So, uh, second. If we look at this uh, uh, problem of a drag, so if you see some objects uh, where uh, the boundary layer is uh, somewhat detached from their body, so that causes more drag. And if you just put uh, uh, the shape of the body like aerodynamics, so it means boundary layer is very much close to the wall and uh, so that experience is less drag. So the whole study of the drag uh, on uh, vehicles, aircraft, bicycles, uh, all are some part of fluid mechanics. Uh, in biomedical engineering, uh, as uh, the application of artificial heart, so the blood is going to flow from uh, one part of the body to another part. I mean that transport requires uh, pumping and uh, artificial hearts are supposed to pump the fluid and uh, this whole new body of knowledge uh, where blood flow dynamics to be studied call it hemodynamics. I mean that is important because the uh, blood uh, is uh, at different viscosities it behaves differently. So in small veins its characteristics is different, in larger bigger size veins its characteristics is different. So this whole study comes, uh, requires the knowledge of fluid mechanics. So, uh, in engineering application there are multitude of engineering applications uh, and uh, 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 for example pumping system. 
So there is a pumping requirement and there is a, a, a system which is uh, supply a certain head and in order to optimize the performance uh, of a pump uh, in terms of the head and in terms of the flow rate which is in gallons per minute. So uh, this requires uh, uh, a matching of the performance parameters. So the whole uh, subject requires knowledge of fluid mechanics uh, uh, in different applications. So pump uh, is in general a category of a device which is actually uses energy to transfer energy to the fluid whereas uh, the turbine is opposite of that where uh, the turbine uses the uh, energy available from the stream of the fluid and convert it into useful work so uh, whole such things like turbines, uh, pumps, uh, compressors and all this uh, come into this uh, uh, the subject called turbo machinery which is a part of fluid mechanics so, so it's a huge subject and uh, uh, in this particular subject uh, we will be dealing with uh, obviously uh, uh, scientific laws and uh, scientific uh, in engineering uh, uh, the problems can be resolved using uh, those laws. So in as a broad category we can divide uh, laws into two types, uh, uh, fundamental laws and auxiliary laws. So fundamental laws are actually the so-called universal laws which are uh, uh, irrespective of uh, the medium and irrespective of the material they are applicable. And uh, uh, in this course uh, we will talk about conservation of mass, conservation of momentum. Uh, and in the later courses like in heat transfer we will talk about conservation of energy too. Uh, so all these laws are fundamental laws. So any process in nature uh, supposed to observe these fundamental laws, uh, uh, which might include the laws of thermodynamics. To for example, uh, the law of conservation of energy is uh, somewhat related to this first law of thermodynamics. Uh, and there is another class of laws which you call it auxiliary or constitutive laws. Uh, uh, in constitutive laws, uh, uh, they are actually depends upon uh, the material or to which it is made up of or it is to which it is constitutive of. So for example, ideal gas law, so where we develop relationship between pressure, volume and temperature. So that depends on a particular mathematical relation which relates these parameters. So uh, this law is only valid for that particular class of fluid which follows certain behavior. Similarly Ohm's law, I mean, uh, which is a relationship between the potential difference and the current. So for uh, ohmic conductor uh, we get a uh, straight line behavior. So for uh, ohmic conductors, uh, uh, Ohm's law is applicable where uh, uh, potential difference uh, resistance is uh, assumed to be constant. Uh, similarly, there are so many other laws which are based on experiments and empirical. So uh, constitutive laws are mostly empirical in nature. Uh, and in this course we will talk about uh, uh, Stokes law and we talk about uh, uh, Newton's law of viscosity. So they are uh, constitutive laws. Uh, uh, these laws actually provides the framework where we can solve our uh, scientific problem. Uh, uh, okay, next is uh, engineering approach of problem solving. So, uh, engineers, uh, appro engineering approach is uh, for solving the problem is a particular approach. In the first case, you develop a clear description of the problem and then uh, you look for the important factors and you make it a certain model and um, uh, either with the help of uh, the experiments that actually uh, help us to improve the model and once we have formulated the model the next uh, job is to manipulate the model. Uh, 
and once uh, we can bring changes in the model and uh, uh, and then obviously we have to check the results of the model so this is called the validation process so this is uh, another integral part so we can divide it into three stages three or four stages first we have a good idea of the problem and second we have to make it a model and then we have to manipulate and validate this model and the results we got is to be presented uh, in the conclusions so, so uh, we have certain physical system and what we do is we turn the physical system into a mathematical model and uh, uh, that mathematical model gives us certain uh, solutions and certain uh, properties, uh, certain parameters and uh, 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 under the given circumstances uh, the, uh, the results of the models become valid. Okay, so this is quite a generic approach of solving engineering problems and in fluid mechanics course also we will uh, make it uh, there is a real life problem and we convert it into a mathematical model by taking certain assumptions and uh, then we will uh, uh, get results. Uh, okay, what actually the steps, there could be four steps uh, we can simplify. First, the real life problem is turned into a mathematical model and that requires the knowledge of the laws associated, uh, whether the fundamental laws or the constitutive laws. Uh, uh, then the second step is once we have formulated the model, then model to be solved mathematically. So this is a solution process and uh, once you have solved, then obviously the mathematical solution parameters related to mathematical solutions has to be turned into the uh, converted back into the real life problem. And uh, in the last stage, we have to validate the mathematical solution. So, uh, in in some cases, we have experimental results to validate uh, uh, the solution uh, from the coming from this model. Okay, uh, then now we will talk about fluid. Uh, okay, uh, let's have an experiment. I mean, we have a, a container and uh, we put some sand particles in it uh, and uh, uh, the bottom of the container we have made a hole and so we allow the sand particles to come out from the hole so what we see is uh, the sand particles when they come out uh, they will uh, uh, form sort of a mountain of sand particles and you see more particles you will find closer to the hole and uh, there are less particles away from the hole. Obviously there is a uh, distribution once uh, depending upon the size of the hole. Okay, let's do the same experiment if instead of sand particles what we do is we put water. What will happen? So if you look at the water, so water doesn't form the mountain of water. I mean we don't see any mountain of water. So why? The question is why water behaves uh, differently uh, from compared with the sand particles. So uh, the reason is uh, actually the fluid is something, a substance which is something which is not able to retain the, uh, the shape, uh, unsupported shape and obviously it flows uh, under its own weight and it takes the shape of the container. So fluid is something, uh, if you put it into a container, it will take the shape of a container. And obviously uh, the reasons behind uh, for such a, uh, such a behavior is uh, because uh, there are some forces like cohesive forces. In uh, water, the cohesive forces are much weaker compared with the cohesive forces in the sand. So uh, stronger cohesive forces in the sand keep the sand together, whereas uh, uh, weaker cohesive forces compared with uh, uh, the forces between the water molecules and the container, uh, container material. So these uh, forces are called the adhesive forces, uh, which are between the two different species. Uh, 
so in uh, the reason for water not forming a mountain is uh, water is having weak cohesive forces compared with uh, sand sand have some strong cohesive forces so which is responsible for this shape of the mountain whereas in water these cohesive forces are much weaker so it doesn't form that shape uh, 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 I mean the slight understanding, uh, hopefully you know from your chemistry classes uh, the cohesive forces and the adhesive forces. So cohesive forces are actually the intermolecular forces uh, that is actually present between the molecules of the same species. For example, if you look at the meniscus uh, in a test tube of water, so you will uh, see uh, 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 different meniscus if you have uh, mercury in a uh, test tube. So uh, the reason is uh, water molecules they have uh, uh, some weaker cohesive forces compared with the adhesive forces. Adhesive forces is between the uh, molecules of water and glass. Uh, so the adhesive forces, uh, strong adhesive forces compared with the weaker cohesive forces uh, is responsible for this uh, uh, convex uh, uh, meniscus. And uh, so this concave meniscus in, in case of a mercury is because of the strong cohesive forces in mercury compared to the adhesive uh, forces. So uh, this is uh, cohesive and adhesive forces. Okay, uh, uh, let's move into this formal definition of fluid. So what is fluid? We define fluid is such a substance which deforms continuously. So the key word here is continuously under the action of the shearing forces, however small they may be. So the fluid is actually uh, such a substance which is unable to resist any shear force. How small the magnitude of shear force is, fluid is not going to uh, resist that shear force. Uh, the uh, force which is somewhat acting parallel or tangential to the surface. So uh, for example, uh, if we have a fluid particle at time t0, so all particles can be thought of as uh, a vertical line. So just uh, after time t with the small interval, the fluid particles has traveled certain distances. So their deformation, uh, their displacement is represented by this angle phi. After a certain uh, another interval t, let's say 2t, the particles have traveled to some more distance. Similarly, after time 3t, the, the particles, the same particles which were initially there has moved to that place. Uh, so, uh, what we see is, uh, this is an experiment we have done is uh, between the, uh, the fluid is placed uh, between the two parallel plates. Uh, and we push the top plate in such a manner uh, that the layer of the fluid which is in contact with the top plate starts moving and uh, the bottom plate is considered stationary so uh, the layer of the fluid which is in contact with the bottom plate is stationary so what we see is uh, 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 the fluid particles are moving so once they are in motion they changes their relative position and uh, uh, in contrast, uh, if we see the uh, substance like solids, solid doesn't behave in this manner. So they have an ability to resist the shear stress. So if we apply a tangential force over the area and uh, it stretches out, it deforms and when you remove the force, it returns back once it is in the elastic limit. So uh, the shear force and this deformation obviously is directly proportional and uh, 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 but this thing is uh, uh, peculiar to the solids. Uh, in fluids, uh, fluids are not able to resist the shear stress. So they deform and they deform continuously. So this is how we define fluids. Uh, so once we say the fluid is at rest, 
it means uh, there is no relative motion between the particles of the fluid and uh, consequently there was no shear force acting. So when the shear force is not present we call uh, the fluid to be at uh, rest. So in the absence of the shear force uh, the uh, fluid is experiencing the force which is perpendicular force always the normal force. So when fluid is at rest, all forces in the fluid must be perpendicular to the plane upon which they, is act, uh, they are acting. So when the fluid is at rest, shear force would be zero. Only forces that would be acting onto the fluid particles uh, would be the normal forces. Uh, in contrast, if we see the fluid is in motion, so when the fluid is in motion, obviously the motion is uh, due to the shear stress. So whenever fluid is in motion, uh, uh, we can say there is a presence of shear stresses or tangential stresses. So uh, when we say fluid moves, obviously the, the different positions, uh, uh, the particles move uh, relative to each other, uh, uh, so the different layers would be having different velocities. So, for example, initially when particle, uh, what time was zero, the particle is at this position and after a certain time t1, the particle is at this position. So, uh, fluid has a tendency not to uh, retain, uh, not to uh, unable to resist the shear stress, so they deform and they deform continuously. So, uh, and uh, due to this, we see uh, uh, different layers of the fluid would have different velocities and there is a certain velocity distribution for uh, the direction y which is perpendicular to the horizontal surface. So we say the velocity, local velocity of the fluid particle is a function of uh, y. So at every y, different values of y, we see different velocities. So, so this is uh, 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 the, the distortion, the change uh, uh, in the shape is actually due to the change in the velocities uh, of the fluid at different layers and uh, the layers which is uh, in contact with the solid at the bottom is uh, stationary. Okay, uh, there is an important property of the fluid we call it viscosity. So viscosity is a measure of how well the fluid resists deformation. Some fluids uh, uh, are flowing quickly and uh, some fluids uh, flow slowly. Uh, we can think of water and uh, honey. Honey flows if we drop honey on a flat surface. Uh, it comes down slowly, but if you drop uh, 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 water, uh, it moves so it moves fast. So the viscosity of uh, uh, honey is much higher than the viscosity of the water. Uh, okay, let's uh, have an experiment. Uh, the same experiment we do it more quick, uh, more uh, closely. Uh, we have two parallel plates, infinitely long parallel plates, so, uh, so the, uh, or you can think of a z dimension is infinitely long and there is an x and y coordinates uh, and uh, the bottom plate is kept stationary and uh, uh, the top plate is uh, uh, moving with velocity u and the distance between the plate is uh, b. So, uh, uh, once at time zero, uh, let's uh, we put a die on the fluid particle and at time zero, the, all the fluid particles can be marked uh, with this uh, black uh, color, black spot and after a small interval, these uh, fluid particles would not be the same because the fluid particles which is in direct contact with the upper plate has traveled certain distance uh, and if you know the speed and you know the time you will be able to calculate that distance and uh, this distance is uh, 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 this particle has traveled the distance in time d delta t. Uh, similarly the, the particle which is on the bottom plate is stationary and uh, let's see uh, if uh, so 
what is happening fluid deforms and it has been deforming continuously so if you just think of uh, the fluid which is placed between the two plates uh, in five layers if you think of imagine that uh, the fluid between the layer is in three uh, five layers so layer one is in direct contact with the top plate which is uh, moving with velocity u the bottom plate is stationary and uh, what you call it a layer five so uh, uh, there there this is usually called is a no slip boundary condition the bottom plate uh, because uh, the uh, layer of the fluid which is, is sticking to the bottom plate uh, what's in bottom plate is stationary so this layer is also stationary whereas uh, if you look at the top plate the top plate is in motion and uh, 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 it is moving with the same velocity uh, u capital u so what we see here uh, other fluid uh, particles uh, 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 different layers would be moving with different velocity and we see a typical uh, straight line uh, profile of the velocity so when velocity is zero when you are at uh, y is zero so when your y is uh, equal to the distance between the plate that is at b your velocity is uh, u uh, okay now uh, quantify this uh, displacement uh, and these layers uh, 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 these particles have traveled certain distance so their deformation is represented by this angle and uh, the shear rate is, uh, uh, strain rate the rate of deformation is defined as uh, d theta by dt and we represent by gamma dot uh, using a symbol gamma dot so that would be your shear strain rate uh, uh, from this geometry if you see this 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 is a perpendicular this is a triangle is formed this is a perpendicular and this distance b is uh, base so tangent of this small d theta angle is uh, perpendicular over base perpendicular is this distance so this distance we can calculate if you know the speed you know the time multiplying velocity with the time you will be able to get this distance so this is the perpendicular distance and this is the base so tangent of theta would be perpendicular over base so uh, for small angles we can see uh, mathematically the tangent of theta is same as uh, theta so tangents of d theta would be the approximately would be the same as d theta so instead of uh, tangent of d theta we can write d theta so d theta would be uh, this perpendicular distance or this base which is uh, this uh, distance between the two plates uh, we can write by bringing dt to this side so uh, the rate of uh, ch uh, change of this displacement would be the ratio of u over b so this we can write it uh, d theta by dt is the shear strain rate so shear strain rate we can write it u over b so this we call it equation number one which is an expression for uh, uh, shear strain rate uh, as we know the velocity profile the uh, is linear and the velocity is a function of y since the velocity is uh, changing at different positions we call uh, that velocity to be a local velocity and uh, which is a function of y so if we are interested in calculating the gradient of that velocity du by dy so this gradient would be uh, uh, the velocity uh, which is at when y equals to b uh, minus the velocity when y equals to 0 uh, divided by the change in the distance so this would be the change in the velocity and this is the change in the distance from when y is b it is b and y is 0 it is 0 so the gradient can be calculated so uh, we got equation number 2 from this expression of gradient so now we have uh, uh, shear uh, earlier we have shear strain in terms of uh, u over b 
so we can write u over b would be uh, equal to du by dy so we can say the shear strain rate would be equal to the velocity gradient uh, as we know this is a shear stress so the, the force is acting uh, parallel to the area and that's why we, this uh, is tangential force so shear force which is acting parallel to this area uh, which is uh, area of the plate so this is would be a shear force and we know for uh, uh, so called fluid we call it Newtonian fluids uh, where the uh, shear stress would be directly proportional to the uh, shear strain rate. So shear strain rate is uh, we already have def uh, worked out which would be equals to the velocity gradient. So shear strain rate is uh, 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 directly proportional to the velocity gradient. Okay, we put here a constant of proportionality. This is a so called viscosity coefficient or coefficient of viscosity. Uh, uh, this proportionality constant uh, uh, sometimes called dynamic viscosity as well. So the shear stress would be mu times the velocity gradient. So we can work out the shear stress if we have a knowledge of the velocity profile and once we have a knowledge of a velocity profile we can work out the velocity gradient and multiply by this proportionality constant we will be able to get the shear stress. So what we see here is uh, the shear stress is some function of uh, uh, the velocity profile because uh, du by dy is uh, in our case is a, a linear velocity profile but uh, it could be a non-linear velocity profile too. So shear stress is some function of y. So when y is zero. Uh, uh, you see here, uh, uh, there would be say velocity is zero, and when y is b, the velocity is u. So velocity is changing in the direction of y. Uh, if you are interested in calculating the uh, shear stress uh, at the bottom of the wall, close to the wall, so what we do is mathematically we write like this. So what we do is we have to take the velocity gradient, we know the velocity profile u as a function of y, we take its velocity gradient and what we do is we substitute to y equals to 0 because we are close to the wall, then this shear stress would be called as wall shear stress and we represent by a symbol uh, tau w that is representing the wall shear stress. Uh, this proportionality constant we call we, we have given a name uh, absolute viscosity or dynamic viscosity. So different materials having different uh, uh, viscosity, and this is a non-linear scale. If you see, honey is more viscous than um, water and alcohol or oil. And uh, if you see here uh, at the motor oil uh, SAE 40. The temperature is also mentioned, so it means at different temperatures uh, oil would have a different viscosity. So for example, if you look at this, uh, the how the viscosity changes with temperature. So for oils you see uh, there is a decreasing function as the temperature increases the viscosity is uh, decreasing. Uh, keep in mind this scale is not a linear scale but a logarithmic scale and uh, if you see uh, water here also once you increase the temperature its uh, viscosity decreases. Uh, there is an opposite behavior in when the fluid is uh, gases like air, helium. So as you increase the temperature uh, the, its viscosity increases because of the molecular action which uh, at higher temperatures the average kinetic energy of the molecule is much higher so that is responsible for higher viscosities so the behavior of viscosity as a function of temperature uh, for liquid uh, is different for uh, gases it is different okay uh, uh, when your shear stress is plotted versus the shear strain rate which is du by dy and if it is in a straight line, uh, 
so the such fluids which follow the straight line behavior are called newtonian fluids and luckily the water air and oil three important fluids uh, in our daily life are uh, newtonian fluids uh, and the gradient is actually the signifying the viscosity so higher the gradient for example compared with water oil has steeper gradient so it means have a higher viscosity than water and if you see at water if you increase the temperature of the water its uh, uh, viscosity is uh, decreasing so uh, 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 in this course uh, we will be dealing with most of the fluids uh, in, uh, in newtonian fluids uh, if you see the stress is directly proportional to the strain rate, uh, shear strain rate, uh, so you have a straight line behavior. And uh, there is a particular class of Newtonian fluids where you have such a behavior. And if you see uh, the viscosity, because it's a straight line behavior, so its gradient is not changing. So whatever the shear stray rate is, uh, whatever the force you are applying, the viscosity is not going to change it remains the same uh, uh, and in case of non newtonian fluids you have a non linear behavior so you see first to increase the stress there is a less strain as you increase further stress uh, strain increases and uh, to this point uh, then it becomes a straight line behavior uh, such fluids are called shear thinning fluids and uh, if you see this type of behavior you apply a force but uh, uh, initially there is a larger deformation and higher shear rate and then the, uh, it behaves like a Newtonian. So such fluids are called shear thickening fluids. So in shear thickening fluids uh, uh, or shear thinning fluids, uh, the stress and strain uh, behavior is non-linear. And if you take an example of uh, shear thinning fluids, uh, what happens is uh, as you increase the stress, uh, strain increases and the uh, uh, gradient changes. As the gradient changes, it means the viscosity changes. So viscosity is decreasing in shear thinning fluids. An example is paint. For example, if you are painting, so if you apply a harder force, so what happens is the, plane, the paint becomes less viscous. So it, is, it would be much easier to paint. Uh, whereas uh, the opposite class of fluid, what you call it a shear thickening fluid, examples are corn, starch and sand water mixture, where uh, as you increase the force, uh, the viscosity also increases. So such uh, fluids are called shear thickening fluids. Uh, uh, okay, let's do a uh, numerical or uh, at this point uh, we have two parallel plates, uh, the, uh, the top plate is moving with 4 meters per second and the distance between them is uh, 5 millimeter and the oil is placed between the two plates, its kinematic viscosity is given and we have to calculate the average shear stress. Okay, here the, uh, as we know from Newton's law of viscosity, shear stress is mu times du by dy. So mu is your uh, uh, dynamic viscosity, whereas if you divide this dynamic viscosity by density, we come up with a, a parameter called kinematic, kinematic viscosity. And in most of the fluid flow analysis, instead of mu, we are dealing with mu over rho. Uh, which has obviously have different units, meter square per second. Uh, specific gravity is uh, uh, specific weight of the fluid over this compared with the specific weight of the water. So uh, here we have uh, mu to be worked out, mu would be uh, kinematic viscosity is given here. So multiply by the density we are going to get the dynamic viscosity. So here dynamic viscosity is uh, new times the density of a substance which is density of water times the specific gravity. So density of oil would be 800 kilograms per meter cube here. Uh, and the next thing we need in order to work out shear stress is the velocity gradient. So we calculate velocity gradient. Uh, we know the velocity when y is b is 4 meters per second and uh, there is a no slip boundary condition and the distance between them is uh, 5 into 10 to the minus 3 
I put it that is in millimeters so that is in meters so we end up with this so just substitute in the formula to get the expression for the uh, shear stress so here shear stress acting is 80 pascals uh, okay good to the another problem uh, there is a slag slides along a thin horizontal layer of water between the ice and the runner so we have such a situation in which you have a runner and you have an ice surface and uh, water is uh, between the sled runner and the ice and uh, we are supposed to calculate the thickness of the water layer uh, what is given here is uh, viscosity is given uh, which is an absolute viscosity uh, the runner's speed or the layer of the water which is direct contact with the sled runner will be moving with 50 feet per second so shear stress would be force per unit area uh, and as we see here the velocity is zero here velocity is uh, 50 feet per second for the runner when so we are supposed to calculate the distance b the distance b is something we have to work out uh, we are assuming a linear profile of the velocity so this linear profile is important because uh, in order to calculate the velocity gradient uh, du by dy so we have the expression for the velocity gradient so this would be the velocity when y is b and velocity is zero so you got this expression substitute back in the expression for uh, shear stress force is 1.2 pounds area is 0 0.08 square feet uh, this is dynamic viscosity and velocity gradient is 50 over b so in this equation we have only one unknown so this is what we have calculated in terms of feet. So it's a very small distance uh, between the sl sleds runner and the ice. So it would be, if you calculate in terms of inch, it would be only seven part of the 5,000 part of, seven part in 5,000 parts of, uh, in inches, in terms of inches. Okay, let's uh, finish this. Today we have finished this uh, lecture.